started out in Chicago, then made his way to Asheville, then decided Durham was much more interesting and had maybe a, nothing against Asheville because we love our Asheville, but Durham's startup ecosystem and our ecosystem was a far better platform for him to launch his company. So we're grateful for that. We hope we fill a role in that and your, with your company and many others as well. Um, Francesco, Amini, because I cannot say it a non-Italian way, <laughs> uh, is Italian-Canadian. He says they squish all their letters, so we, we mm -hmm. Amini. <laughs> uh, Francesco, we welcome you and we look forward to hearing the story about induction food systems. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Is everyone properly caffeinated? Yeah, we'll do we, do we, we certainly will. There's no Q&A. <laughs> Uh, first off, thanks for having me here. Thanks to a million cups RTP uh, for letting me present to you, letting you know what we're up to at Induction Food Systems. Uh, I can give you a, a bit of a background about who I am. Uh, my name is Francesco. I'm new to Durham. My fiance and I moved here about six months ago, uh, as mentioned, from Asheville, uh, in part because of the ecosystem here. And so thanks again for being a part of that ecosystem. Uh, and in my previous days working in nonprofits, we'd always do a good morning shtick and we'd give, give ourselves a big round of applause. But I'm going to spare us all. That, that, uh, that circus and just let you know exactly what we're up to. Uh, and we're gonna be talking today about heating and food. Uh, you probably are aware that most of the consumer packaged goods or CPGs that you eat or consume, uh, this ranges from everything that we'll be talking about from fluid milk to salsas. Anything that goes into a jar or a can or a pouch that's fluid has to go through a pasteurization process. Likewise, the manufacturing plants uh, where all these foods are processed and made have intensive heating needs. And that's the space that induction food systems is working in. And we're taking some advanced technology, it, actually technically it's old technology, and we're spinning it into a new application and trying to figure out a way to increase efficiency and productivity and quality in food and beverage manufacturing. Let's start with the pain points. The pain points are that food production is a low margin business and you are capped in terms of how much you can actually produce at your facility by your cleaning time. I know it doesn't make sense, but imagine an auto manufacturer and they had to shut down for at least 15% of every day just to clean the floors. Wouldn't you want to look at how fast the floors are being cleaned? It's the same thing in food and beverage, except in food and beverage it's more of a critical process because it has to do with food safety. So food manufacturers for an average plant, we're talking about at least a half million dollars in just lost production time alone, not to mention the opportunity cost of what it takes to actually do the cleaning. Cleaning is expensive and time consuming. It takes a long time to heat your water to, to clean out your pipes and your tubing and your pasteurization skids. Skids is a fancy word of saying a bunch of stainless steel mounted on more stainless steel that you can pick up with a forklift. So if I use the vernacular, please excuse me. It's a business that doesn't have high margins. This is a risk averse group and they're being squeezed right now. So margins are low and there's things uh, in terms of a market shift. If anyone's been to Whole Foods or have been in that store, you know what that market shift is like. People want different kinds of foods than what's currently being produced. Not only that, but there's something called FISMA, the Food Modernization and Safety Act, which is making it very difficult for plants to continue operations as usual. There's a lot of impetus to change in this industry, but not a lot of ways to do it. And that's where we come in. That was my big intro. That's where we come in. <laughs> Thank you. We're looking at the heating process and redesigning it to be much more efficient and above all faster and more controlled. Instead of waiting, let's say for example, two hours for your water to come up to temperature, we can do it in about five minutes. And we can do it with much, much greater control. And this is really where the promise of induction heating like you've heard of those cooktops, we're doing that on a continuously flowing industrial scale. This is where the promise of induction heating really comes into play. Because if we can control temperature within half a degree centigrade, as opposed to two degrees, which is the plus or minus for what's currently on the market, we can actually reduce the amount of fouling. And if anyone woke up this morning and had egg whites, if you cook that in a pan, you know how sticky that gets on a skillet. If you have eggs, it takes a long time to really scrape that off. Imagine doing that over, I think, a thousand meters of piping. 
That's the cleaning process that egg producers have to go through, that cheese sauce producers have to go through. And it's expensive and it takes a long time. And in part they have to do it because of the buildup on the sides of their piping. And that's because they're using steam. They're using steam systems that do not have fine temperature control. The real promise that we have for the industry are not only that we can do it faster, not only that we can do a better job, but that because we do a better job with better temperature control, we're going to reduce the amount of egg that bakes on your skillet, if that makes sense. Everyone with me? All right, fantastic. And in this business, efficiency is, is margins, right? Your downtime, your productivity, your yields, those are the metrics that food manufacturers use, and that's exactly the space that we live in. Uh, in terms of how do you change, you can talk about manufacturers and why they would use our equipment and technology. We're also making it easy for them to implement. Typically, you would have a, a plant that wants to expand. They need about $300,000 to expand just to have the capability to heat water for their expansion. We can do it at, at a much less cost for them. So we help them avoid capital expense. We help increase their efficiencies. And when we start looking at food production and, and food heating, we can do it to give them more uptime and productivity. So this is kind of a cross-section of what our technology does. If you're familiar with induction and the way those cooktops work, you know that you can actually touch that cooktop without it being hot. Everyone familiar with this? Everyone seen these things? So your pot heats up, and that's because of magnetic resonance. So you have electromagnets in your cooker that really connect, and the, the magnetic flux binds to your pot. And your pot heats, instead of having a flame, which loses heat and light through the sides, inc incomplete combustion, which then heats the pot, which then heats your food. Instead, you're heating the pot itself. We use that same principle, and we look at putting that inside of a pipe. I'm not sure if you can see this little glowing thing. But we have a pipe, and on the inside of it, we have what's called a specially designed workpiece or applicator, which receives the magnetic flux. So we literally heat pipes from the inside out. We can do this uh, very, very effectively. And most importantly, by maximizing surface area to volume ratio, and I'm not a trained bench scientist, but whenever I say surface area to volume ratio, the food scientists really light up. Because they know that they, <laughs> they really do, it's, it's incredible. They know that if you can do that, and you can bring a food product up to temperature faster, you actually retain more color, quality, nutrients, and flavor of that food, as opposed to the current systems, which really steam blast the hell out of it. <laughs> which, is, which is true. Uh, so we heat from the inside out, we bring product temperature much more quickly, and that's because of our high surface area, and we're really minimizing the thermal transfer distance. So heat doesn't have to travel that far to get through a flowing stream of fluid. It really only has to go maybe a tenth of the, tenth of the space. So it has to do with, with design, it has to do with um, the way that we can figure out how to reduce uh, between the fluid flow uh, our control systems and our heating source. So all those things, all those three things, talk together in our system in order to give you higher quality products as well. So here's a little bit of a comparison, so you can <clears throat> see. This is what's typically done in what's called a steam retort. We've all had kind of uh, mushy green beans. Anybody been to summer camp and had mushing green beans? <laughs> That's some yeses. This is what we can do with our technology, right? So it's brighter color, it's crispier, and it's not mushy. We make our money uh, by selling our key induction components uh, to OEMs. OEMs is a fancy word of saying original equipment manufacturers. These are people who are really good at welding, and that's not us. Uh, we, we sell our heating equipment components to them, and then we also sell complete systems. So our business model works where we sell you key components and then we outsource the fabrication of it. We then buy back the unit and then we sell that unit either through a distributor or directly to a manufacturer. How are we gonna get these clients, these are manufacturers, why are they gonna go with new technology? Well, we're gonna do it in three ways. One is working with uh, industrial engineering firms. So the industrial design firms that design plants that are the key decision makers for how you expand a plant or build one those are who we're going to target because they're the ones who are going to be doing things like minimizing capital cost, maximizing plant efficiency. That's typically not a decision that's made at the brand level that's done by industrial design firms. So that's who we're going to be talking with. We're also going to be working with incubators so we can be positioned at the nexus, which is a fancy way of saying where cool stuff is happening. We're going to be right working with new brands because there's a lot of new action, like I mentioned before, an $18 billion shift 
in food and beverage right now. And it's all coming from new brands. People want new products. And if we can get in with them, if you pardon the food pun, we can bake our process in with their products. And then also leveraging distributors. Uh, food's a, a really reputation-built business, and we're not going to be, as a, as a new kid on the block, it works better for us to leverage people who have an existing reputation. So the business model is not that insane. It's really the technology that's the big advance here. This is the IFS team. Uh, Dr. Sadler is the CTO. He's the technology's inventor. He's our NASA-funded food scientist. Uh, I'm Francesco, and then on, on the left-hand side, you have a group from a Raleigh-based company called Sinovatech. They are the experts in microwave processing, and they're our strategic go-to-market partners. So they're providing extra engineering and design assistance to help us get our product to market. This is where I wanted to kind of kick off the Q&A. Uh, we're a newer company. Uh, we incorporated two months ago. And we have challenges, like most startups in the area and most startups, period. Uh, first of which is trying to go from our bench scale prototype, which can do a half gallon a minute. Uh, how do we actually take that to a commercially viable product? And the, really the key component that I'm hoping to talk to you all about is electrical engineering. The components that we're using in our current system we're buying off the shelf. Uh, the, right now, for the base, the base level unit, the smallest unit we'd like to offer, that's about $50,000 for our base induction heating components. That's a lot of money. We need to get that cost way down. So part of our go-to-market strategy is how do we get that component cost down and we'll have to vertically integrate that function. In other words, we need to redesign our heating system, uh, the heating components, the induction power supply, and which is an electrical engineering job, but I don't know any electrical engineers in the area. So maybe you all can help me with that. <laughs> I hope so. I hope so. Uh, the, other, the other thing I wanted to ask you all about is, is in the software world, you look at user experience. You iterate based on feedback, and you keep working that cycle over and over and over again until you've got a product that works. And when you're pushing code, that makes a lot of sense. But we're dealing with hard engineering costs that are big, piece, big pieces of stainless steel right? in manufacturing environments, which are already risk averse. We don't have as many loops around that cycle as a typical software product does. So we need to find a way that we are able to work and find the right development partners who are interested in piling new, new tech, who are interested in looking at bringing new tech into their plants, which may not sound like a big ask, but for them it is, because their whole business model runs on keeping everything exactly the same, because that's where they get more efficiency. And we're looking at disrupting that cycle. So it's a big industry, and it's ready for disruption. We just need help disrupting it. So that, that's what we're up to. That's, that's the, the 30,000 foot overview of what we're doing. Yes? Quick question. I mean, I, it's hard to answer any of those questions if you can't show us a differential value prop that you're working with. You know, I, I don't care what the equipment costs. You can finance it. You can also, you can do all kinds of stuff, but that's irrelevant. Compared to what they do today, to get that extra certainty you want in the process overall, how do you, what's the value prop on cost or long term benefit? On the pricing downstream side of their product, or is it just a little ladder out of the that's, a part of it is it's a, it's a black box until we have some actuals to work with. Uh, the, the theoretical value, just say theoretical, but the estimates that we're working with is that if you can bump up plant efficiency by 1%, for a mid-sized producer, that's about a $2 million increase. And we're not exactly sure how much we're going to be cutting down our cleaning cycles, but we're estimating the ROI is going to be about $400,000, so it'll pay back for itself in about a year. Does that make sense? Via increased efficiency, be a, a better product quality and lower. Which means your product cost is not your problem. I would hope so. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the question. The, the other thing I wanted just to ask, my name's Rick, by the way, and I had a question. Um, you, some of the partners you're looking at with this and is utilities, because of massive incentive and rebates in the food sector, especially in this area of the country with Southern and Duke Power, which are huge. Uh, that's somebody else I would identify and take this product out there. Just follow up on with Chris, if you had your biggest competitor, what's your cost versus their cost? But more efficient, uh, more important is, what's the efficiency from the electrical standpoint? Even though your process is great, you may say, but on the cleaning standpoint, is there gonna take more electricity or is it less electricity than what's currently out there? Sure, I can answer that question. It's a two part, it's a two part answer to that question. Everyone got that question? Are you gonna be paying more for energy because you're doing this faster process? Is that, is that what that question boils mm -hmm. down to? The answer is we are on par with steam, which is the typical way everything is heated. Uh, we are 95% efficient in terms of putting electric energy or input energy into end target heating. Fancy way of saying we capture all the heat we make. 
So we're very efficient. Because we're so efficient, we're basically a wash in terms of cost, even though natural gas is at an all-time low and electric is still much higher. We're also, I guess I should have also mentioned this, we're electrifying a piece of industry that so far has not seen any efficient options that give it the opportunity to shift to electric power as the way that it's powering its core processes. Everything is run off of natural gas and big steam boilers, which are very inefficient. So to your question, the energy, it's, it's pretty much a wash in terms of energy, energy cost. Thank you. So you're putting something in the pipe that's part of the process, right? Yes, sir. That's exactly right. Let me see if I can go back here to go to this diagram and. So if you if you if you do that, what does it do to the overall output of that that process? Does it slow? Do you get less out? You can you can actually get more if you time it right. That's more of a function of the pumping mechanisms and not necessarily our heating. Uh, because we have a lot of flexibility in how to design it. We could design a heat exchanger that was about the size of this microphone, or we could design it to be the size of the table. Uh, for us, we have so much flexibility that we're not worried about the throughput necessarily for the equipment, and that's more of a function of, uh, honestly, not our process, but the step that comes after us, how you fill into a pouch or a bottle or a jar or whatever you're going into. That's typically the production bottleneck that we work with. So it's typically not on us to slow everything down. Typically in, in the plant, the heating process goes on and your backlog is waiting for your filler to keep up with what's coming through the pipe. That's a great question though, thanks. So do you know your price, so the, I'm going back to price um, for the targets. For steam has to have a certain price that you're looking to match it. Because you you want to match that price is where you're going. Oh, you want to match the steam price. So what is that steam price? Because you said it's 50, you're at fifty thousand dollars is what you're currently. What steam is price so that we know what you've got to get to? Sure, sure. That, that's a great question. And let me clarify: fifty thousand dollars for a four component for a built-out skid. And I can give you an example for a small, a small water heating unit that we're looking at. Uh, the smallest base we could get to is about one hundred forty thousand. A typical pass, a typical uh, what's called a clean and place skid that we're competing against is going to be around seventy five. But our argument to the, to the manufacturer is you're paying a premium for this because it gives you a few options, uh, one of which is CapEx, cap, CapEx avoidance. Because our systems are modular, you don't need to build out uh, fixed infrastructure in terms of piping. So basically, you don't have to call your plumber to be able to plumb all your, all your steam traps, uh, your condensate returns, and your steam lines. We can say, we can just plug this in. You pay a little bit more for that convenience, but if you need to resell this thing, that's okay. Because this is, this is a movable asset as opposed to you have piping that can do one thing. So that, that's part of our, our difference in, in pricing. And in terms of our margins, if we can get our component cost down for that main electrical engineering component, that's gravy for us. That, that's also a very good question. Comparatively, steam equipment is very cheap because it's the standard in the industry. We're coming in with a more modular, flexible solution and asking manufacturers to pay a premium for that. So, uh, great presentation. I'm a question on, um, so the technology you mentioned is, is an old technology, but you're reapplying to this, to this process. Um, it, is there any barrier to entry if, if you get successful in converting and disrupting, you know, some of this newer emerging food processors? Like, do you have any IP? Is it, is it going to be something that other manufacturers can get into easily? Uh, how do you protect what business you, you build? That's a great question. Thank, excuse me, thanks for that. We have an issued US patent. This is uh, Dr. Sadler, who I mentioned on the team, has been working on this technology for about 10 years. So it's been in the pipeline for a while. So we have a little bit of IP around it, which I think puts us uh, in a different category from most startups, but we're really early stage as far as company is concerned. I think the best way that we're going to look to protect and put up more barriers around us is speed. I think really once we get off for the races and, and really show everyone what we can do, the faster we can move and the faster we can expand in the industry, the more we'll be able to lock down anyone who'd be able to compete with us. So I think it's a two-part strategy for us, one of which is, is IP protection, which is going to keep uh, our patent right now, as it's written, it's enough to scare people off, uh, but having one patent, is pretty. you can design around it pretty easily. Until we build out a really robust IP portfolio, it's going to be speed and market penetration. Uh, Everyone what I understand from everyone that we're competing with, which are the steam manufacturers or the steam boilers and the heat exchange makers, they don't really care. They, they're, they're looking at doing what they do cheaper and not necessarily interested in innovating, which makes us, I think, a good acquisition target. Investors, talk to me later. 
So the fluid flows through the pipe or like food fluid like milk and things. Mm -hmm. And then so then you you're increasing the, the surface by putting in the, the metal core in, in the middle. So uh, how do you clean it? The cleaning is done in the same way that most uh, pipes are cleaned in a food plant. You basically take high pressure hot water, which we are also heating by the way, that has either caustic or acid solution uh, as part of the, the detergent. So you basically, and with high pressure, high pressure pumps, pump hot water through these pipes. Uh, so a chemical force and a mechanical force and a thermal force all help remove any sort of buildup that you get on the surface area, on the surface of the heat exchanger. Yeah, yeah. It might actually be uh, be easier, and that's because the diameters are smaller. The larger diameter your pipe, the more horsepower, the more temperature, and the more water you need. So it's harder on utilities. If it's smaller, it's actually going to make it's going to reduce the usage of all those things. But to your point, uh, I understand. If if we end up doing a bad job, and I will say this is a drawback of our system, because we have so much surface area compared to other systems, if we do a really bad job of processing eggs or milk or whatever we're going to be running. Well, it'll be much more difficult to clean. But the idea is because we are so good at having temperature control that we're able to step the product up so there's not a real difference between cold product and the heating source. So we can really ramp up nice and smoothly to avoid that bake on, to, to avoid fouling on this surface right here. So what's the main reason that you have to design the metal core in that shape? Well, the answer is that it's more, we can get product, to faster, product up to temperature faster. So the more surface area we get, the faster we can put the heat into the product. Because it's basically a convective process from the hot element inside. And if we maximize the surface area, that lets us get the whole, whole pipe up to temperature faster. If we wanted to, we could design it with small surface area, to your point. Yeah, it's, it just feels like it's more complicated structure. Yeah. Thanks. I had another question. Uh, when you're talking of the package systems on skids, two things along that. Can you piggyback for a product? In other words, somebody buys unit one from you and they expand their operation. Instead of buying a whole new piece of equipment, can you just piggyback with what you've already sold them and increase the capacity? Yes. Okay. Second thing is, have you ever thought about um, putting these on skid and leasing them to manufacturers and sell off the leases to capital groups? Yes. The, uh, the feedback we got on that strategy was that this is, this is too new, that no one really understood the resale market, and so the risk was very, very high for that type of scheme. If, if there's a group that wants to do that, I'd be more than, uh, that's a real interest of ours, to help you know, increase adoption and lower the barriers. Uh, as long as you can write off that, and if I was more of a CFO, I'd be able to tell you this, as long as that manufacturer could also write off uh, those leasing costs as CapEx, I think that'd be fine for us. So you had brought up uh, some sort of regulatory um, language earlier. Is there anything that you're going to have to get into a position where you essentially ask for forgiveness and not for permission, or you know, are, are any of those regulations going to thwart the utilization of this new process? Because what the boiler people could do is lobby to get you nixed. So do you run any regulatory risk in this you know, food safety arena where somebody could use that to bludgeon you and lock, lock you out? Well, I don't want to be bludgeoned. <laughs> that, that, that's a really astute question, so th thank you for that. The, the short answer is no. And the reason is, uh, when, we, when we're talking about our, or the right way to say this, we are not a novel technology in that we have a brand new way of uh, getting your six log reduction in microbial count. We are not using plasma, we're not using uh, omic, we're not basically zapping electricity through. We're still using the same old tried and true heating method as pasteurization is always used, except we have a very different way of applying it and configuring it. So all, all the FDA is worried about and the process authorities are worried about is time and temperature. And because we're convectively, which is just basically hot element next to something not hot, as long as we can measure the time and temperature that we, we've got it through our system, uh, it, it really it lines up perfectly. All, our, all the guidance we've gotten from FDA was, we don't care how you get it hot, which is a different topic, uh, 
They just want to know it's gotten to the right temperature and it's held for 15 seconds, 35 seconds, and they're good, which we do. I was just curious about the idea of like, what are your competitors doing? Is it something like, I mean, they have like Teflon line pipes or have you done the research on that idea of what, what are you, what are other ideas for making it easier to clean these pipes? I'm just curious. You know, there's some interesting work being done on NC State, but it's not at the commercial level yet. <clears throat> the sorts of, um, in, the, in the food world, I guess my point earlier about how it's an industry ripe for disruption, there's not a whole lot of um, R&D being done, and any R&D is being done at the university level. So manufacturers just want to be able to buy something and, and plug and chug. They're not that interested in, in putting in their own R&D dollars in things outside of product formulation. So it, as far as we've been able to see, no one's really working on this product, uh, sorry, on this specific problem besides us and a few other folks, one of whom we've teamed up with to come to market. Could you go into your relationship with Sinovatech a little bit deeper and then sure. tell us more about your background and how you ended up with this business? Happy to. Uh, we are involved with Sinovatech. They're, like I said, a strategic development partner. They are going to be our outsourced engineering. So they are going to provide engineering services for us. Uh, we've worked out a business arrangement where they're I'm not sure how into the weeds we want to get in terms of uh, the business arrangement. We can talk afterward, I can tell you more specifics. Um, but they are giving us uh, extreme discounts on their uh, manufacturing capabilities uh, and their engineering capabilities in order to help us get to market. So we're basically working on being able to not pay them as much up front and then they get something on the back end. Does that, is that good enough for now? We can talk later to give you more specifics around it. Uh, my background is in public health. I am not a trained food scientist or an engineer. Uh, I came to this by looking at, uh, at food systems and saying, how do we improve the food system? And as I started drilling down, I saw everything was made. There's a bottleneck because all the food you get is made in basically the same ways. There's two or three options. And so I started looking at technologies that were involved with that. And by working on different projects, I got to know Dr. Sadler and looking at his technology. And from where I saw food and beverage going, I said, this is the time to commercialize. So we decided to strike up a business arrangement and, and go into business to commercialize this technology. And, and where is Dr. Sadler's from? Chicago, sweet home Chicago. I should also mention that the, this tech got its uh, first funding from NASA uh, and the USDA because they wanted a way to feed lunar and Martian colonies and you can't do it with steam. You're not gonna truck up all your food. You can't use steam on, you're not gonna bring natural gas on the space shuttle. That doesn't make sense. So you need a way to use renewable energy and they were looking for electric alternatives. Uh, so we have $3 million in funding via SBIR grants and that's what got us to this stage. So we've established proof of concept and now we're looking to take our, our our pilot, pilot scale and go up from there. So we can have a commercial scale prototype that we can then go to product, have a product out of that, if that makes sense. Okay, we're scaling up. We have another we have a little discussion here about, this is, this is modular, can you bring this like on trucks or in areas maybe disasters or over countries that might need it, if you ship it over there and boom, you have an instantaneous you know, factory hook up the electric Absolutely, and, and I didn't want to mu muddy the waters too much with kind of the base technology, but that's where we'd like to go. Ultimately, we'd like to be doing international development work. We'd like to be taking these modular units uh, and reducing post-harvest losses in terms of crops. I think, uh, I can't get too much into it, but we're in conversations with a group in Kenya that uh, has, has sweet potatoes that are going rotten in the field and they need to process them faster as a way of reducing post-harvest loss. So ideally, we'd like to be in that space long-term, but there's a number, there's quite a bit of engineering and time we have to put in before we get there, but you're right on. Um, I have a question. Um, um, it's a great product, but uh, there's a guy in Germany, uh, his name is uh, Lama, he's an engineer and all that stuff. But in terms of uh, uh, when you do uh, a process or whatever, you're building a plant, boilers are designed to, you know, custom, it's not just a boiler. It has to be customly made for that processing and all that stuff. And in terms of that, it has to meet the pipeline and uh, the pipes, you know, the pipes so that they can run their processes the way it's supposed to be. But there's a guy, his name is uh, Lamen, he's, he's from Germany, he's a German guy. Uh, in terms of like uh, what you're talking about, maybe you might want to look it up. He has a, um, a special um, lining, which uh, it's a pressure like way it sucks and everything. By end of the day, I mean, maybe you have to wash the post, whatever, clean up in 15 minutes. He shuts it down and it's made out of corn. He sucks it out 
and it rinses away and comes out another coating on that. Maybe you might want to look at that as one of your competitors. I mean, what you're saying, it's a great product, but I would suggest if you want to get it there, because most of um, processes, uh, manufacturers, it has to be designed, you have to do a physique study, and each boiler and pipes has to meet that and all that stuff. Have you done any testing with some of the pros, uh, some of the uh, manufacturing, whatever, you know, people, food processes and all that stuff? We have it in, in different scenarios. So we've, we've done some cheese sauce testing for a big cheese sauce manufacturer, uh, and we're able to see how, how their process works. And that's a really great point. Every plant has their own unique process and their own pipe diameters for their volumes that they're running, specific for the products they're running. We think we can actually bring a little standardization to that system uh, by saying that we have a lot of control over how we design our heat exchangers, and we'll have some stock ones that we say this for this diameter versus you know one and a half inch, 30 millimeters, whatever they're going to be, and we can start going to production with those. We'll be able to get a our costs down by standardizing, uh, and b because we have uh, this is the platform. And ideally, we'll be able to look at nuances in the platform about how we control how much temperature and where it goes in the system. Uh, so ideally, we'll be able to have a platform to say, okay, it doesn't, man it doesn't matter if you're running fluid milk, if you're running orange juice, if you have particulates, we can use our same platform and then basically tweak the control system instead of having to rebuild piping. So we'll be able to do it all more or less digitally, make those uh, adaptations and changes and customizations, that's probably the right word for it, digitally instead of needing to bring in welders to be able to build your piping specifically around uh, how much steam you need and how many DTUs you need to heat your process. Did, did that answer your question? And I'd like to ask you for that German uh, yeah, fabulous name too. Yes, thank you for that. That's another good point. Our main clients are going to be new and expanding manufacturers. It'll be very difficult to convince a, a company that has assets in place that are making them money to take them out to put ours in. That's a real uphill battle and I don't want to fight that. So we're looking at, at expansions, which is why industrial design firms are going to be really great for us. We're going to be able to work with them because they're going to know who's expanding, where the construction projects are. I think there's about 600 a year that go on in the U.S. Uh, just to keep that in mind. But that's a really good point. Uh, new manufacturers are where we want to be. And this, this is really interesting. Um, I, I live by the saying, anything's possible if I don't know what I'm talking about. So <laughs> I just want to throw something out at you. Have you thought of or have any of your competitors used microwave technology? For, in looking at this, I could see having a pipe that had a microwave around it be very low, um, low energy use, I would think, and that could do that, that same type of heating. That's a great question. Uh, there, are, there are a few groups that do microwave heating. Uh, the world's leading experts are Sonovatech. They're the ones we brought onto our team because they understand uh, process flow, and really it's about being able to control pressure in a continuously flowing stream, which is what makes their microwave system possible. So we found the world's experts in there and we teamed up with them. But you're, you're right on. It's, it's, the, it's the same idea. We, we have complementary technologies, which is why we wanted to start working together. Um, actually, uh, I had another question. You just mentioned something that was kind of interesting. So you said you don't want to go after existing manufacturers necessarily because it'll be too much of a too much brain damage to convince them. But you know, what if you approached it from like an auditing perspective and said, "Listen, you know, like somebody goes in and audits energy bills or cleaning bills. You know, these people are getting raped regularly, and they go in and say, all 'All right, I'm going to save you, you know, 50 percent, and I want 20 of that.' You know, so you go in and you can say, "Listen, because you said." A 1% increase in efficiency usually equals about 2 million bucks. Right. That's, so if you have some, some good metrics, baseline metrics you're going in with, you know, you can walk out with a percentage of those increases and pay for this equipment nine times over and, and, and you know, approach the existing market that way. Um, and it could create like an interesting way that you, you know, the thin line of the wedge, so to speak, 
to you know get into the existing market because the purchasing managers of those companies have to be looking constantly. If you're on that low of a margin to begin with, you're going to always be looking for ways to save. It's the other people and the rest of the company that are probably reluctant to the change, but the, the people who are doing the purchasing, I have to think, or the CFOs are always looking. So I don't know, that might, it strikes me as one way to approach this. That, that's a great concept. I'd love to talk with you more about that after we're, after we're done here. The, where we are right now, we're too early stage and we don't, we don't have those metrics, right? Th these, are, these are what we're projecting out. This is based on how we can control temperature right now. So we're, we're really confident about how we control temperature it becomes a little bit more of a translational science to say, what's, what's that do for your bottom line? And so there's a number of steps that we need to validate along that ladder, uh, which is why the partnerships that I talked about are gonna be uh, really important to get to, uh, so we can kind of develop, the, develop the, the case for it. You had talked about uh, shortening the feedback cycle, and um, one of the other industries that's uh, kind of going towards organic um, is We, we have not. Our expertise really lies in, in food and beverage manufacturing, but not to say that we would, if it's a similar, if we can basically build out our platform by going to an adjacent industry or a different industry niche, uh, we'd be happy to do that. Uh, if you have any contacts, I'd love to talk to you about it. Thank you. Seems like uh, this might be very expensive to develop and get the right system in place. Are you looking to raise money from VCs? And if so, how much do you need in order to, to get there? That, that's a good question. Because we're, we're streaming on Facebook Live, I can give you kind of a general answer. Uh, and we can talk more specifics uh, afterward. Uh, we already have $3 million pumped into the base technology. So if, if I'm uh, a, a VC or an angel investor, hopefully I'm making a good enough case where, as that angel investor, I see, well, someone's already taken a bunch of the risk off the table. Uh, we need about, if I had to estimate it, we need about a half million to get to a working scale prototype for our uh, water heating system. That's a clean in place technology, which is a lower, it's, it's easier for us to get to market with heating water than heating food. Uh, we think it'd be about a million and a half to do the food heating R&D. Did that answer that, Mala? Yeah. Good morning and really interesting presentation. Thanks for sharing. Just a couple of quick things and uh, much like our com commenter in the back, I don't know really what I'm talking about here, but uh, one organization that I've recently come to know is uh, CTAC, S-E-T-A-A-C, and I can give you the full name afterwards, but they're based out of the University of Georgia and they focus on helping manufacturers lower expenses and they go in and do an audit, so building on the audit comment. So I realize it's a bit premature in your current uh, life cycle to really consider that, but there are organizations out there that might be uh, good partners for you. The, the second one, just driving here this morning, I heard an article a story on the news about we're in the longest run of lower food prices that we've seen in a long, long time. And they mentioned specifically uh, eggs and dairy products. And I don't know if that's impacting some of the manufacturers that you're targeting, but that may give them a, a moment for pause to say, how can we yet one, once again lower our expenses? That's right. And that's a very good point. I heard that NPR article yeah, too. Yeah. That, was, that was a good one. Yeah. And, and, and you're right, commodity markets are going to be up and down. Yeah. And we're right now we're in, we're in a glut, especially for dairy. Um, what we're also doing, I guess, I guess to your point, uh, I would hope that manufacturers would say, listen, our, our prices are going to vary, our inputs are going to vary about what we can get for them. Uh, sorry, our inputs are going to vary on cost. We don't know how much we're going to be able to sell our fluid milk for per gallon or per pound. We need to look at efficiencies again. I would hope that they'd, they'd come to that same conclusion. Yeah. Just a couple other things. Um, just a point on presentation is great. Um, but what I would say too is if you could do an animation in regards to the process, you could be able to show somebody through. That would be very helpful from a conceptual standpoint of that quite a bit. And the other thing is, I'll talk to you later, but there's a couple of energy accelerators in Charlotte too. That you C need CLT to Jules is being one of them? Jules, yeah. Right. Yeah, Brian and those guys down there. But they're a great asset for you to talk with the utilities too. So. Great, thank you for that. Let, let's chat afterward. Yeah. Um, so I'm a sales and marketing guy. So I, I, I think you're when you talk about disruption, right? You're gonna you you say you're gonna uh, hit skepticism, right? 
skepticism doesn't work. Skepticism does the value proposition, you know, that your theoretics, you know, kind of say you're going to save here, here, here. Well, so my my thinking is it, you got to get as much as you can or as quickly as you can a working model in in field such that you can then sort of validate all your things you know you know fly in or bring in prospective purchasers to sort of see this thing in motion this is what we're doing this is how it works this is how easy it is you know that kind of thing before anybody's going to take a step into that direction and maybe you need to sort of say you know what we're just going to fund this thing on our own and, and get a working model up and work with this one organization and partner with them to sort of say, you know what, this is our tour tour facility or whatever, and, and have them, you know, have prospective clients come in or whomever. Because right now it looks great on, an animation would be great, but even the reality would be even better. That, that's an excellent point. And that's been kind of the chicken and egg thing that I've been wrestling with. Uh, so we have a benchtop unit that, that can process a half gallon a minute. But that's not enough to make any manufacturer. That's enough to say, okay, it, it proved the concept. We're now we're in talks with people to talk about their pilot plant. We're not really hitting the big time manufacturer. So, so you're right on about what that barrier is. I think we're about $500,000 away in, in three months uh, if, if we get the funding. I think that's what it would take for us to go from that bench top unit to a, 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 a real production prototype to say, come on down, come on down and see this. But you're absolutely right. No one's gonna invest uh, in, in this type of equipment unless they've seen a few use cases. So building out that pilot, that pilot system, building out that, that partnership to say, this is how it works in the field, is going to be really important to us. Um, I have a question. Uh, increasing efficiency, um, improving the bottom line, these, these kind of things are, are you know, good business cases, but the, um, in order to get the sale, like what's the pain point that some of these manufacturers are having? Um, you know, you're talking about going to new people who are new manufacturing, um, they're looking at it, but I'm guessing if there is this big shift, there's going to be a pain point in the other manufacturers that maybe they'd come to you at that point or be more motivated to join on and, and try something out. Sure, and, and part of the issue with, with our technology, that's a great question about uh, pain points, is that the food business still makes money, right? No one is, no one is losing money right now. Or, when we say we're going to, you're going to lose less money or have a more efficient production cycle, for some folks that doesn't resonate. For some people they're saying, well, you know, we're already making money with how we have our plant structured, so we do more of the same. I think it's probably a similar argument that most startups face with a, an established industry, right? We have technology, it works like this, why would we change? So we're, we have to say is really make that crushing business case. I think crushing is really what we need to work on to say, not only is it more efficient, but we're going to start moving the lever on your main metric, which is production and production efficiency and how, how efficient your plant is. I think for all, all the reading and research I've done is that plants are maximum 85% efficient. So we talked about that automotive manufacturer, 50% of their time is spent mopping the floor, that becomes an issue, right? For food and beverage, 15% of their time is downtime to clean. And so that's, that's how we're positioning ourselves to say, we're gonna work at that junction. So you can have more uptime, your production runs can be longer and you're gonna have less downtime. And if we don't focus on that, I think, I think you're right, we're not going to be able to you know, hit their pain point well enough to say, we should invest in new technology. We have time for one more question. Y'all have been great, by the way. Thank you for all the questions, and I really appreciate it. You guys are really on it. When I gave the same, same presentation in Asheville, I had a lot of questions about if I was going to be magnetizing people's food or not. And, and the answer is no, but I appreciated the concern. <laughs> but you, you, all, all these questions I've had about you know where the pain points are in in, uh, in traction. How am I going to get traction? How does this work as as compared to that? It's all the same questions I've been wrestling with for the last uh, last year or so. So you guys are right on it. So I appreciate that. Um, can you walk close to the pipes with your credit cards? You walk. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the short answer is no. <laughs> The short answer is no. We are, we're, we are working on some shielding so that the magnetic flux won't, uh, you know, get onto your watch and heat up your watch instead of the, uh, <laughs> the interior of the, of the pipes. And we're looking at some advanced composite materials to help do that too. Um, well, thank you. Uh, thank you now we have, we have a few minutes. Um, anybody have any community announcements? I promise this will be the last time I ask, but uh, we need to still, um, for the GTI program, NC State need about five more mentors. So if 
you're thinking about it, it's a great worthwhile time for the thing, and I won't bring it up again after this. Thank you very much. Global Training Initiative. Any other comments? Anybody need help with anything? Anybody struggling? Good morning, everyone. My name is Kimberly Calhoun, and I just want to say it's great to see how much this program has grown in my two years of trying to get here when I can. Chris and the team have been great. Um, my two companies are really doing good. Uh, one of them is MoneyMasters.tv. We've um, put out our third edition of our magazine. It's about entrepreneurs. It features John Fanning. It's a wonderful magazine, we think, this month. Uh, we'd like to get some feedback from the community of how we're doing. We've picked up some wonderful um, article writers, and our magazine's expanding to collaborate with another magazine real soon, so we're very excited about it. We're still hoping for airtime, but we haven't received that yet, uh, but we will be posting clips of our interviews of uh, some really fascinating people. Um, and it's just great to see that this many people are attending this program. No. Um, and uh, I'll say that Million Cups, we're always looking for more volunteers as people drop off and people go away and come back and go away and come back. Um, so if anybody comes here on a regular basis and could pitch in a little bit, um, talk to Chrissa, talk to myself afterwards. Um, other than that, thank everybody for coming.